Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to, again, thank you for attending this special 150th Giant Leaps Ideas Festival event. We've had many, and we're um, really coming close to the end of next Friday's finale. I hope all of you were able to join that as well. Um, today, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome Dan Skrvonsky, who is the president of Lilly Research Laboratories and chief scientific officer at Eli Lilly and Company to Purdue University. Purdue has and continues to have many touch points with Eli Lilly, and we're especially pleased with our new five-year scientific research partnership that many of our faculty and students are engaged in. Eli Lilly, as all of you know, is one of the most respected pharmaceutical companies throughout the world, and it is one of Indiana's real treasures. I'm relatively new back to the state, and I have just been impressed with all of the touch points with, Illy, uh, with Lilly, the Lilly Endowment, and the Lilly Foundation. They have made a tremendous difference um, on all of us in the state of Indiana. Um, in addition to his role as the president of Lilly Research Laboratories and Chief Scientific Officer, Dan serves as Senior Vice President of Science and Technology. He also has responsibility for global business development. Uh, Dan joined Lilly in 2010 when the company acquired Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, where he had been CEO since, the founding, since he founded the company in 2004. At Lilly, Dan has held various roles, including Vice President of Taylor Therapeutics, Vice President of Diabetes Research, and most recently, Senior Vice President of Clinical and Product Development. Um, he just shared that his current job is one of the best in the world. Uh, Dan completed his residency training uh, at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He received both his M uh, master's and um, his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. He earned a, his bachelor's degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University in 1994. Please join me in welcoming Dan to our 150th Giant Sleep celebration, and I look forward to enjoying his presentation, What If We Stopped Fighting Disease, um, together with all of you. Please welcome Dan. Thank you, Teresa, for that kind uh, introduction. And thanks, uh, all of you, for being here on this uh, gorgeous Friday morning. Um, I'm sure there's other things that you could be doing than sitting in an auditorium, but I will try and uh, make this an interesting morning for you. I'd also like to thank uh, President Mitch Daniels for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, you may know that President Daniels is a Lilly alum. and. Uh, He's also not the only connection that Purdue and Lilly share. Purdue and Lilly have a very long association, probably longer than most of you would guess. When Purdue established its pharmacy school in 1884, it was at the suggestion of John Newell Hurdy, who was an Indianapolis-based pharmacist, and he was a protege of the founder of my company, Colonel Eli Lilly. Purdue's president at the time went along with the idea to start a school of pharmacy on the condition that John Hurdy himself would serve as its first dean, which he did. The school originally had a student body of seven and a faculty of just four, but it grew quickly. And when it moved to a new building in 1930, the furnishings in that building, the furniture in that building, was provided by the grandson of our founder and the CEO at that time, J.K. Lilly. The very first chemist ever hired by Lilly was Ernest Eberhardt, and he was, of course, a graduate of Purdue's School of Pharmacy, pictured here with the CEO, J.K. Lilly. One of the other early deans of the school is the great-grandfather of our current CEO, who, by the way, is also a Purdue grad. In fact, today, 1,251 Purdue graduates work for Lilly. That's more than any other college in the university. 
uh, other college in the country. Second place, by the way, is a school south of here in a town called Bloomington. Maybe some of you today will join Lilly Purdue Connections in the future. But I'm here today to talk about innovation. There's a lot of innovation to talk about here at Purdue. Purdue's Discovery Park, which was created with help from the Lilly Endowment, is one example. An interesting project coming to life at Purdue's Discovery Park is research into nutrition and medical needs for a hypothetical future colony of life on Mars. Of course, Lilly doesn't plan to move to Mars anytime soon. But still, I'm glad that this kind of research is happening here. And I hope that someday it will be put to use. When it does, it'll be another in Purdue's long history of achievements in the field of aeronautics and astronautics. Only six decades separated the Wright Flyer rising from the North Carolina sky and the Apollo lunar module descending to the surface of the moon. That's an incredible amount of progress and accomplishment in such a short period of time. And Purdue helped speed it along. You provided the support. When Amelia Earhart was preparing for what would be her final flight, Purdue's board, on which J.K. Lilly sat, helped fund it and financed the repair of our plane. Here's a letter from J.K. Lilly to the president of Purdue promising a donation of $2,500 for Miss Earhart's flight. You, Purdue, also provide the knowledge. Purdue graduate Cliff Turpin was part of the Wright team and helped redesign their motors and control system. Another Purdue grad, William J. O'Neill, helped build the Galileo spacecraft that reached Jupiter. And of course, famously, you provided the manpower. There's a reason Purdue is known as the cradle of astronauts, 25 educated here. That famously includes, of course, the first to reach the moon, Neil Armstrong, as well as the last to set foot on its surface, Gene Cernan. I don't doubt that some current and future Boilermakers will eventually push that number well beyond 25. This makes it an exciting time for me to visit Purdue. Not only is it your 150th anniversary, but it's, of course, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. The moon landing remains astonishing to me five decades on. It's one of America's signature achievements, and we should celebrate it. Of course, it didn't come easily. It happened because of incredible amounts of work and sacrifice. You know this well. Two buildings on this campus are testament to that. They bear the names of Gus Grisham and Robert, Robert, Roger Chaffee, both of whom were Purdue grads both of whom perished aboard Apollo 1, the pre-launch fire. Grissom and his crew gave their lives so others could make this one giant leap for mankind. As he said shortly before his death, if we die, we want people to accept it. We are in a risky business, and we hope if anything happens to us, it will not delay the space program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of human life. Indeed, it was. Yet, reflecting on all of the sacrifices that were made in pursuit of our goal, and looking back at the crowning achievement of 50 years ago, I can't help but feel a bit sad. The progress that took humans to the moon was fast in coming, but achievements in the five decades since then have been slower. Exploration of space is simply no longer the same priority for the American people and our government that it was in the 1960s. National priorities have changed. Interest and enthusiasm of our citizens has waned. And progress has become slower. Humans first set, moon, set foot on the moon 50 years ago. They stepped off it three years later. We've not been back since. Imagine the thoughts of an astronaut, an engineer, any scientist who was involved in the Apollo program in the summer of 1969 as they reflected back on the incredible progress in 60 years and projected ahead to what might be possible by the summer of 2019. Vibrantly inhabited, self-sufficient space stations for sure. Exploration of Mars, no problem. Colony on Mars, quite likely. Plans were being drawn up back then. New conquests were imagined. 
Unfortunately, horizons that we hoped to reach half a century ago have gone unexplored. A first mission to Mars is still a dream. As a child, I was fascinated by rocketry and space exploration. Like many others, I designed and built model rockets, trying to improve their range, figure it out. I went to space camp. I experienced a childish version of astronaut training. Along with a few of my equally minded friends, we drafted blueprints for spaceships that could carry humanity beyond the solar system. Naturally, I knew the names and histories of all of our great astronauts, and I planned to become an astronaut myself. My children, however, don't share the same sense of excitement for rocket science and space exploration. I'm not sure many children today do. Of course, as someone long fascinated by space travel and one who sees incredible value in it, I find the decrease in our national enthusiasm somewhat saddening. But there's something else about the trajectory of space program that concerns me. In many ways, the exploration of the heavens and the eradication of disease are alike. For thousands of years, people have dreamt of flight. And for thousands of years, people have dreamt of curing disease. And yet it is only in the last century that we have made meaningful progress in either areas. But while our advances in space exploration have slowed, progress in disease fighting has actually accelerated. And while I don't think too many children today look up to our greatest chemists or scientists or dream of being a drug discoverer like me, I do think that we're living in the moonshot era for medicine. What we have accomplished in medicine in the past century is astonishing. What we are poised to do in the coming decades will be nothing short of miraculous. I'm reminded of this every morning when I walk into work at Eli Lilly and Company. This statue sits in our lobby. And here is the image that inspired it. This photo taken in 1922 is a young patient, JL, stricken with diabetes and literally dying in his mother's arms. For thousands of years, diabetes was a mystery, confounding doctors who hoped to treat it, killing those who it afflicted, like this young man. Doctors suggested cures that were little more than shots in the dark, rides on horseback, severe diets of potatoes or oats. By the early 20th century, those suffering from diabetes were prescribed 400 calories a day on a dangerous starvation diet. Still. It didn't stop the disease. A diabetes diagnosis remained little more than a death sentence. Then in 1923, collaborating with Banting and Best at the University of, Tor of Toronto, Lilly introduced Islatin, the first commercially available insulin in the United States. It revolutionized the way those suffering from diabetes lived, and it replaced certain fatality with a chance for long and active lives. The work of drug hunters and their collaboration with Lilly gave JL and countless others a reprieve. It solved a centuries old riddle. Today, thanks to insulin, diabetes is a treatable condition, not certain death. Polio also likely affected humans for thousands of years. There were occasional outbreaks in the United States in the 19th century but it became a full-blown epidemic in the early 1900s. Appearing in summer months, moving from town to town, it brought a form of near hysteria with it. Thousands were diagnosed and thousands became paralyzed and died. Children were particularly vulnerable. Families were quarantined. The names of infected patients were published in the newspapers. There were no treatments. Ideas suggested by doctors such as baths in almond flour were futile. At the tail end of massive trials, Jonas Salk and his research team created a vaccine using dead strains of the virus. By 1953, 57,000 cases of polio were reported. 3,000 of those patients died. The next year, the Salk vaccine was approved, and 15 years later, the total number of paralytic cases in the United States was just 53. Today, it is, of course, zero. 
Lilly was the largest manufacturer of the Salk vaccine. We designed a separate building for its production, and Salk himself described the company's efforts as something beautiful to behold. If production of insulin was our Kitty Hawk, eradication of polio was surely our first moon landing and an important milestone in the advancement of vaccines. Childhood vaccinations have together created a radical and once unimaginable improvement in human health. The resulting decreases in childhood mortality have fundamentally changed human society around the world. With increasing odds that a child survives to adulthood, birth rates always go down. As families get smaller, women are freed to contribute in other ways to society. And with increased investment concentrated on a smaller number of young children who are now likely to survive to adulthood, education thrives and ultimately prosperity increases. And the wheel of science accelerates again, allowing even greater advances for society. Let me share another example from our moonshot era. For thousands of years, humans had experimented with the use of fungi for medical purposes. But only about 90 years ago, Dr. Alexander Fleming discovered that penicillium mold secretes an active substance that can kill bacteria. Progress was slow for the first decade. Then the research was accelerated in the early 1940s when scientists treated sick mice for the first time with a purified form of penicillin. This coincided with World War II. Soldiers who suffered from wounds and injuries were getting septic and dying. A mass effort began among the allies to scale up the production of this new infection fighter in order to save lives and win the war. It crossed continents and countries. While the Allied Command planned the invasion of Normandy, back in the US, companies like Lilly played their part in the world war effort. In Indianapolis, the work began with an air conditioner and a flat bottle. Soon production grew more sophisticated. An old warehouse was crowded with two quart milk bottles laying side by side, penicillin growing inside. By 1944, the company had its first tank full. The following year, the new wonder drug was available for mass use. Soldiers suffering from sepsis in field hospitals were treated quickly and effectively. Cases of gangrene were eliminated. This secret weapon, a wonder drug, saved thousands of soldiers' lives and then helped them defeat Hitler and save Europe. And Lilly was probably one of the largest producers for the US government. This creation of modern antibiotics was surely another successful moonshot for modern medicine, fundamentally changing again the course of human history. Lilly contributed not just by making penicillin, but inventing important antibiotics, drugs like vancomycin, erythromycin, as well as the entire class of cephalosporins, including powerful drugs like Keflex and Seclor. As a result of this work, society changed once again. Communicable diseases, which were once a leading cause of death in the United States, became a footnote on mortality tables. As a result of progress in treating or preventing infectious disease, life expectancy skyrocketed, moving from just 45 years at birth at the turn of the century to nearly 80 years today. Changes in life expectancy have driven a growth in the elderly share of our population from just 4% to 17%. And the number of elderly in our country have increased over 15 fold. These demographic changes have in turn impacted how we spend corporate and government money on healthcare, driving costs to treat newly important chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, and type two diabetes, which along with cancer, are today's leading causes of death. Today, the moonshots continue. Let me share a few modern examples just from Lilly's lab. Psoriasis is a disease that affects, a million, affects millions of Americans, characterized by scaly skin lesions and other symptoms, including severe forms of arthritis. There were no major breakthroughs in treatment of psoriasis until about 20 years ago, with the dawn of biologic therapy 
and anti-TNFs. And you can see on this graph, 30 to 40% of patients on anti-TNFs could achieve this high level of response, 90% clearance of the symptoms of their disease. People hailed this as a miracle for treatment of psoriasis. But look what we've done even in the short time since then. Scientists at Lilly and elsewhere continue to track down the genetic basis of the disease, identifying a gene and protein IL-17 as a potential player. Biopsies from the skin of patients suffering from psoriasis showed a particular type of helper T cell that secreted IL-17 was enriched in patients with psoriasis. And our scientists at Lilly created an antibody to block IL-17 and tested it in patients. And the results are what you can see here. We and others now have drugs that block IL-17 approved and available for patients. And up to 80% of patients can now achieve near total response and clearance of psoriasis. What once seemed impossible today is routine for most patients with this disease. Migraine is another significant medical illness. About 36 million Americans suffer from migraine, most of them women, mostly working age, many of them with families. Many patients with migraine suffer 10 or more attacks in a given month. They often suffer in silence with incredible costs to productivity, society, family life. Scientists at Lilly and elsewhere discovered that when a patient was having a migraine attack, the levels of a particular peptide that can serve as a neurotransmitter called CGRP were elevated in the blood. In difficult experiments, they also learned that if you injected purified CGRP into patients who are prone to migraine attacks, it would stimulate an immediate headache. So our scientists designed an antibody to attempt to block the effect of CGRP in the body and test it in migraine patients. In the clinical trials that were later published in journals like JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine, we studied patients who had severe forms of migraine, on average 10 attacks a month in this trial. By the end of the trial, the incidence of migraine in these patients on average had dropped in half. Imagine that. And a significant fraction of patients had no migraine attacks at all in a given month. Now drugs like ours and others that block CGRP are available and widely used to prevent migraine attacks in patients. Shown here are the results of a drug that we're testing for cancer. This drug, salpercatinib, we're testing in lung cancer. It's not designed to treat every patient with lung cancer. This drug targets just about 2% of people with lung cancer. Those patients who have a mutation, a fusion, and a particular gene called RET, we know that that genetic abnormality fuels the tumor growth. And scientists set out to try and design a specific small molecule inhibitor against RET. Testing it out in patients who had their tumor sequenced, and just in those patients who had this genetic abnormality, the results are shown here. Each line on this graph represents an individual patient. If the line is going up, their tumor is growing as it was when they entered the trial. If the line is going down, they're responding to this drug and their tumor is shrinking. This particular graph shows patients with metastatic lung cancer, so the disease has spread to other organs in the body. Many patients in this trial had spread of disease even to their brain. And these patients had failed most other available therapies. They were at the end of the line for treatment of lung cancer. In a setting like this, we would be excited to see 20 or 30% of patients responding. What we actually saw was 70% of patients responding. And the trial continues on. This is an example of what we consider to be precision medicine, identifying just the right patients who are likely to respond to a therapy designing the drug to target their particular abnormality, uh, and then testing it in those patients. We also work in type 2 diabetes. Of course, type 2 diabetes and obesity 
are a major cause of mortality in society today as a driver of heart disease and stroke. This drug called terzepatide is a dual agonist of two incretin pathways, GIP and GLP-1. We designed this peptide and tested it in patients with type 2 diabetes. And here you can see results from the first phase two trial uh, of this drug, testing it for six months in patients. And the results uh, were really astounding. So on the left is hemoglobin A1C. It's a marker of long-term glucose control. Uh, we had dramatic results here. And at the highest dose of this drug, nearly a third of the patients at the end of the trial, when we looked at their long-term glucose control, it was indistinguishable from a patient who did not have diabetes. They were normal in their glucose control, something that's never been achieved before in type 2 diabetes and has never been thought to be possible in patients with this disease. On the right side, you can see another powerful effect of this drug, weight loss. And in this phase two trial in six months, at the highest dose of the drug we tested, <laughs> patients lost on average 11 kilos, 25 pounds of weight loss. Imagine losing 25 pounds for a person with obesity. Many of these patients return to normal body weight, normal weight, normal glucose control. The ability to reverse type two diabetes is something that we strive for and now we believe could be possible in the future. From insulin to penicillin, from the Salk vaccine to our recent discoveries for migraine, psoriasis, cancer, and type 2 diabetes, these achievements are our equivalent of Kitty Hawk, the Mercury program, the Apollo mission, moonshot after moonshot after moonshot. We are firmly in an era of multiple moonshots. We've come so far so fast, and perhaps because of the speed, we take some things for granted. Certainly there are diseases that once killed with regularity, that struck fear across the world, whose names children born today will never even know. They've been banished to the historical record, and many more will join them in coming years. Diseases like Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer even, may someday be little remembered or feared. But here I have to put an asterisk. Earlier this month, Gallup released a poll ranking the popularity of US industries. Pharmaceutical companies ranked dead last, behind banking industry, behind the oil industry, even behind the US government. <laughs> How could it be? 60% of our country thinks poorly of the industry that brought all of these medical miracles to life. They don't see us as akin to astronauts. Far from it. I think they see us as Darth Vader. Uh, as a Star Wars fan, I take some objection to that. But scan the headlines. You'll see drug makers described as evil, greedy, or even criminal. Watch congressional hearings. You'll see us described as that. And you'll hear the assertion that drugs don't come from pharmaceutical companies, that they come from academic and government-funded research. They believe that large pharmaceutical companies just swoop in at the end of the process and profit off the discoveries of others. I didn't come here today to absolve the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not going to tell you that companies in it have not made mistakes, that some of our unpopularity may be self-inflicted. Nor will I tell you that drug making begins and ends with pharmaceutical companies. But this I don't hesitate to say. Without large drug makers, the medical equivalent of a mission to Mars will never launch. Moonshots are impossible. The next wave of disease eradication will never crest. You don't have to strain your eyes to see what the future could hold, though, for medicine. We will engineer cells in the laboratory to create programmable disease fighters that can be reimplanted into the body to cure cancer or autoimmune disease. This is happening already today. In our labs at Eli Lilly, we're engineering stem cells in the lab to become pancreatic beta cells. We're encapsulating them so we can transplant them back into patients and permanently cure type 1 diabetes. We hope to make our own product, insulin, obsolete someday. It's working in animal models. 
We'll be testing it in patients soon. For diseases like Alzheimer's disease, we've created new tools that allow us to track the disease in living patients and test potential treatments more quickly. In an individual subject, we can watch the ravages of the disease spread from neuron to neuron by sequential imaging, and we can treat them with drugs designed to stop the spread of the disease. Every day, we draw nearer to meaningful therapies for this difficult diseases. And we are engineering RNA to create a whole new category of drugs. We're using messenger RNA to coax patients' own cells in their body into creating their own cancer vaccines. We're using siRNA to turn off genes in nerves that are implicated in pain and genes in the brain that cause neurodegenerative disease. Our missions to Mars are within reach. The impact of medical advances in the next 50 years will be just as great as it has been in the last 50 years. The chances of all this unfolding, though, will greatly decrease without large pharmaceutical companies. They will be zero, in fact. We can't fight disease without companies like Lilly. And if we stop fighting disease, so many lives will be lost. The cost will be devastating. My mission as chief scientific officer of Lilly is to make sure that half a century from now, we don't look back on this, on this, our moonshot era of medicine, and lament how fleeting it was. My charge is to make sure patients and their loved ones are not still waiting on answers for the diseases that we have it in our power to stop, or will soon. At Lilly, we continue to advance the science. We never stop innovating. But our ability to do this does depend on factors beyond our control. If we're viewed as villains, if society sees ever less value in our efforts, the framework in which we innovate is in jeopardy. I say this not simply as a representative of Eli Lilly and company, but as someone who's seen and played a part in the ecosystem in which drugs are created and diseases are fought. As a doctor, I've participated in patient care. As an academic scientist, I've worked on basic research. I've participated in drug creating process, both by founding and leading a biotech company and now leading research and development at one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in America. Through these experiences, I've learned that there's multiple indispensable players in the advancement of medicines. All of these players together form an ecosystem. And the last one I mentioned, the big pharma companies, are also crucial for breakthroughs. Those who argue otherwise, who doubt the worth of drug discovery and drug development, should consider what the healthcare landscape would look like without it. No insulin, no polio vaccine, no antibiotics, no treatments for psoriasis, migraine, cancer. It's not an encouraging image. Modern day medicines are not magic. They don't come from a flash of inspiration and then ready for patients. Rather, they're the result of a long and difficult and expensive R&D process. On average, drugs take 10 years from target to launch, and the success rate for projects is far less than 1%. Thousands of researchers are involved in the process for each project, and it costs nearly $3 billion to bring a single successful drug forward. Yes, academic research often begins this process. But the task of discovering, developing, producing, distributing drugs falls to the pharmaceutical companies. And it's an enormous undertaking. Think about this. The invention of rockets had to be followed by NASA's massive efforts to send man to the moon and bring them back safely. In the same way, academic discoveries must be followed by the massive efforts of pharmaceutical companies to create safe and effective medicines. The accomplishments of the last century, sending humans into space and the moon, stopping diabetes and polio, were not fated to happen. They weren't inevitable. The course of human history does not naturally tend towards the betterment of the human condition or the eradication of disease. It only happens because of incredible amounts of work and sacrifice. It only happens because of imagination and collaboration. We see this both in the history of space exploration and the history of fighting disease. These are two of the most challenging pursuits known to humans. 
yet much like America's space program with its tragedies and struggles, pushing the boundaries of medicine remains a highly rewarding pursuit, one that helps and inspires millions. Here at Purdue, both of these pursuits are alive and well. Here on this campus where Armstrong, Grissom, and Cernan all walked, the study of rocket science continues and students still look towards the stars. The new space age, driven by the private sector, may be upon us. Purdue is preparing to play its part. And of course, here in West Lafayette, the quest to understand and end disease goes on, just as it does at Lilly. It has to. We're facing formidable challenges as a society. Life expectancy in America has declined in recent years. We have epidemics in pain and addiction, mental health and gun violence. We have incredibly important work to do now and in the future. Those of you who are passionate about fighting disease and alleviating human suffering, be aware, be engaged when it comes to policies in affecting innovation. Continue to support and encourage science education and research funding. Do all you can to demonstrate the value in what we do. Regardless of the opinion polls, and in the face of challenges, I remain optimistic that our moonshot era in medicine will indeed give way to even greater accomplishments. Companies like Lilly and institutions like Purdue have unlocked mysteries and found answers in the past. Let's continue on to reach and explore new frontiers in the future. Thank you very much. Excellent. I believe we have a panel discussion next. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank Dan for the really inspiring uh, presentation. It really captures the contribution uh, from both Lilly and Purdue to society. And uh, in the next 30 minutes, I like that we have a faculty panel discussion with Dan. And uh, I would like to maybe first uh, introduce the panel. Uh, we have John Tesmer, who is a Walther Professor in Cancer Structural Biology. And uh, John specialized uh, in uh, understanding the molecular basis of uh, G protein coupled receptor signaling. And he also interested in developing structure based design to target the GPCR kinase for cardiovascular disease. Next to John is Aaron Ghosh, uh, the Ian well, uh, Rothwell Distinguished Professor in Chemistry um, and Medicinal Chemistry. Aaron actually is the inventor and discoverer of uh, Darunavir, which is an FDA-approved uh, uh, drugs for treating HIV and AIDS, and was approved in 2006, one of the widely used medicine to combat these diseases. Arun's lab also continuously uh, improved this therapy for HIV, but also expand to other therapeutic areas in Alzheimer's, for example. Next is Jackie Lennis. Uh, she's a uh, Martha Gross Professor in Biomedical Engineering. Her expertise is really in microfluid. Uh, she uh, specializes in invention of uh, point of care diagnostic and molecular sensors uh, for substance abuses. Uh, and then we have Chris Roche, who's a professor of medicinal chemistry and molecular pharmacology, and John Donna Krinsky, uh, director of Purdue Institute of Integrative Neurosciences. Chris was trained as a neuroscientist and biochemist and specialized in protein uh, aggregation and in relevant to uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, in particular Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. My name is Zhongyin Zhang. I'm a professor of medicinal chem chemistry and molecular pharmacology and director of Purdue Institute of, for uh, Drug Discovery. So I want to just uh, start, um, you made a very strong case about the need, uh, the importance of uh, public uh, support, appreciation of innovation and uh, in supporting our, our fight against diseases. Um, and so clearly there's a uh, you know, all of us in the room need to really uh, to have responsibility to advocate and support uh, society and the funding agency to continue our research. But I want to turn into a te technical aspect of drug discovery. That is, despite all the advances you highlighted, 
that uh, we've made uh, to improve human health over the last 100 years, there's still too far many human diseases and they're still not curable and not even be manageable today. And so there's often said that drug discovery is not rocket science, it is not. But um, if we could send a human being to the moon 50 years ago, why curing disease so difficult? So I just want to open up this to the panel. And what is about drug discovery that's so difficult? You want me to start? Well, you know, of course, it's, there's two aspects to it. Um, one is just the complexity of human biology and understanding how to uh, impact that biology in a, in a way that affects a specific disease. Sometimes we get sort of lucky where there's uh, one specific target that we know impacts the disease. The example I showed in all of the examples really in infectious disease, you know what causes the disease, you kill the organism, solve the disease. Uh, those are great successes. Sometimes even in complex diseases like psoriasis, you can find a, a linchpin in the disease. In that case, it was IL-17. Impacting that practically cures the disease. But more often, it's a combination of factors that cause disease. And that becomes really hard. Um, and we don't always have the right scientific methodologies, really, to test the idea that you need to impact at multiple places. Uh, in, in the biology of, of a cell or an organism to, to change disease course. So I think that's one of, of the big challenges. The other is when we look at all the different targets in a cell, there are some that have been up till now generally off limits, just things that we can't hit with small molecules that are inside the cell. We can't hit them with antibodies, and so we sort of shrug our shoulders. I think that's changed with gene therapy and RNA therapies. Um, and other more advanced new ways of making drugs, we can, we're getting to the point where any target we want, we can access it. And uh, I think that's a huge advance. Mm -hmm. Other panels um, members are free to chime in. From yeah, others. first of all, I would like to thank you for a really very motivating lecture. Uh, as you mentioned that our students, you know, our younger generations, they're not pursuing science or medicine, or drug discovery. Can you comment on why? Why do you think there's less interest towards drug discovery or you know, pursuing rocket science? What is your you know, perception? Yeah, I, I, uh, I am not an expert in, in childhood education or in why people choose different things. Um, but I, you know, like many people, I've watched my own kids go through their science education. Um, and Teachers matter so much. It's so important to have an inspiring teacher or mentor that gets kids excited about science and technology. So I, I think that's one aspect. We need to invest more in science education. Um, the other, uh, for sure, must be the things that we see on the news. If we vilify the people who work to make new drugs, who, who will want to go in that profession? Okay, my second question is, if you look at the history of drug discovery, you know, all emanated from natural products. You know the history of Eli Lilly discovery and, 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 and the help with the penicillin to vancomycin. So natural product plays such an important role. At the same time, if you look, look at today's Lilly's effort, all the natural product isolation, all of these things has been dismantled. And you are actually, even company like Eli Lilly, making large molecules, large library of molecules, hoping one of them become a drug. So this kind of perception also really not helpful for you know, what is happening today. Today we understand a lot of you know, disease in molecular level. Protein structures are known. We know where exactly you know, catalysis is happening. You know, structure-based design of molecules is very important. If you look at the history since late 19, uh, 2000, so we have probably 60 to 80 drugs literally developed based upon structure-based, protein structure-based. On the other hand, now you can see companies like Eli Lilly dismantling medicinal chemistry, which is basically, you know, all making molecules overseas. And, you know, this teamwork where medicinal chemists, biologists, pharmacologists work together, that is not happening. So my perception is probably that students are not enjoying the scientific discovery. 
what can you do to bring that back? Yeah, that, that might be partially true. Of course, I, I hope we're not dismantling uh, medicinal chemistry, but I, I do uh, agree with your comment that it would be better to have multidisciplinary integrated groups. I think if we see chemists as just sort of people who make molecules and biologists as, as people who study cells, it, it won't work. We need chemists who understand biology and biologists who understand chemistry, and we need them working together closely, probably with physicians who take care of patients as well. Um, and that isn't always the way the pharmaceutical companies have been structured in the past. So I, I do think that's important. With, with respect to natural products, of course, you know, th there was an era of phenotypic screens where you would just test different things on cells or organisms and see what happened and look for one that looked like it was improving disease. And then we moved towards, as you, as you described it, molecularly targeted therapeutics, which has been great. Um, right. but, but actually now, uh, I do see an opportunity to do more phenotypic screens because we can actually now, for the first time, have the tools to deconvolute the targets. So when you see a natural product that impacts biology of, of a cell organism, you can uh, figure out how. Whereas in the past, it was kind of a mystery, and often drugs would launch you know, a decade before we would even know what their molecular basis of effect was. So there's, there's some hope there as well. And I'm not going to take too much time. Okay. So my last yeah. comment here, you know, your talk is extremely motivational and also philosophical. So now Eli Lilly, you know, I know what Eli Lilly is doing, at least from you know, reading their emphasis, is putting huge effort in biologics. And yep. biologics, one of the problems is, of course, biologics are tremendous, you know, curing a lot of disease, unthinkable. At the same time, the major problems of all biologics is you're tinkering with immune system. And basic problem there is infection, right? So just imagine that penicillin was not discovered and vancomycin was not there, Eli Lilly. What would have been the situation? So can you comment on that? Biologics have many advantages, I think, over small molecules. Uh, primarily, though, it's the specificity that they interact with their targets. So as you well know, small molecules often hit multiple different targets, and it's hard to get them to be exquisitely specific for just one target. With biologics, it's much easier and, and more highly predictive. And so if we have a target that is outside of the cell, that's on the cell surface or secreted, that we want to inhibit, then sometimes if we want to activate it, biologics are the fastest, most efficient way by creating an antibody against that target to, to make a drug that we can test in patients. Now, because they're injectables, that's the primary drawback, not really immune modulation, but uh, because they're injectables that patients have to inject into their body, uh, we often then try to follow up with a small molecule that can be made into a pill, which patients often prefer. I do want to, yeah, Chris. Sure, uh, I'd like to go back to Zhang Yin's initial question as well about uh, why diseases are, have proven to be very difficult to cure. Yeah. From the perspective of neurodegenerative diseases, uh, there's a lot of interest in those diseases here on campus. They're becoming more and more prevalent in society, and of course, you mentioned an interest at Eli Lilly. And so to answer that question, I would say that there are three obvious obstacles. First, first of all, that there are multiple forms of diseases that we actually consider a single disease. So it's probably not just one form of Parkinson's disease. So it gets to the point of precision medicine or the need for it. Uh, secondly, the fact that these diseases are largely uh, underway or 50% complete potentially by the time they're diagnosed with current neurological criteria for diagnosis. And then the third is the fact that they're very slowly evolving. And so th that slow evolution poses clear issues with respect to clinical trials. And so I'm wondering what Lily's perspective would be with respect to some, yeah, some of those, at I least some of those obstacles. I agree wholeheartedly on, on all of those uh, uh, challenges. And, and probably they together account in totality like for the failure of, of progress in developing therapies for these diseases, um, which we've participated in. We've learned from those failures. Um, and so we've tried to address them. So one is molecular phenotyping of patients with imaging so that we try and get a more homogenous group of patients. We can also do that earlier in the disease stage, so try and get them before they're symptomatic, before the disease is past the point of no return. And then finally, I think we and others are probably turning more and more towards rarer subtypes of neurodegenerative disease where there's a known genetic abnormality 
It's likely to be a very homogeneous population with a rapid disease course. If we can intervene in those diseases, then I think we can learn something that we can take back to the vast majority of sporadic Alzheimer's or Parkinson's patients. Um, but it, it's been uh, certainly a hum, humbling experience working on neurodegenerative disease for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Jackie? As somebody who works in diagnostics, that was the type of thing I yes. very much appreciate that you can't treat what you can't detect um, and, and to be able to do better detection. But how, how do you envision um, sort of the improving technologies as we're in this more connected, more digital world? Are those going to be able to benefit the type of um, treatment and uh, yeah. detection that you see? Uh, coming out of Lily? I don't know yet. I, I do know that like molecular phenotyping of disease is incredibly important. And so like it, it, it has paid off in oncology already. And that's the example I showed. You, you can sequence tumors, identify the genetic mutations, target drugs. Outside of oncology, there hasn't been much progress, unfortunately. We generally still treat diseases as symptomatic clusters. The, the question that you asked specifically is could we use digital devices, wearables, massive amounts of data from Google or whomever that's spying on us? to uh, like figure out what specific disease you have. Um, I don't know, it's, it's often talked about, that like if you had enough data and artificial intelligence, it'll pull out some cluster of, of actionable uh, disease. But as of yet, I, I can't think of a single example of, of success there. So we're investing there, but I'm, you know, I don't know. It, it must be true and it must work eventually. Um, but I, I probably could have said that 10 years ago and maybe 10 years from now. Yeah. Right. I just want to get back to your, your initial question, why do we have disease? And, um, you know, one of the reasons that we will always have disease is our remarkable ability as living organisms to adapt. You know, and when we, we send drugs into our systems, the proteins that we are targeting, the genes will mutate, you know, in cancer in particular. So there's always going to be this resistance mechanism building up against any treatment. You know, we see it with antibacterials, for example, on a living organism scale. In cancer patients, you see it in people um, being treated for AIDS and, and related symptoms. You get this resistance mechanism. So there's always gonna, meet, gonna need to be this drive to innovate and find a, the next tool that you can use to, to help these patients. And I don't see how that's gonna happen without big pharma, you know, um, you know, um, having a massive effort to find these new compounds and new therapies. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's almost a little disheartening that if you find a nice treatment for a small lung cell carcinoma, for example, you just know that those patients on that treatment long enough are probably going to regress and yes. get mutations. What's the philosophy in the industry then? You know, to, you know, you have a great cancer drug, but you know, Probably, you know, yes. your patients are going to revert. So we we know they almost certainly will. So so for example, the example that I showed, the RAT inhibitor. As right. soon as we started that program, or you know, it was actually a biotech company that we acquired, those scientists, they said, okay, we anticipate that that there's going to be mechanisms of resistance. We have some hypothesis based on cell experiments what that will be, and we're already starting to make the second generation drug. At the same time as they make the first one, the second generation drug that anticipates the mechanism of resistance. By the time the first one was in clinical trials and we had the first patient who developed resistance to the drug, we took their tumor, we sequenced it, we determined the mechanism of resistance and continue to adapt our research program. Now, the, the challenge there, uh, and we'll have a drug, a follow-on drug that, that targets the mechanism of resistance. The, the challenge there is that the, the populations that you can treat get smaller and smaller. It's just like antibiotics. Like if you have a, a great new antibiotic that treats highly antibiotic resistant organisms, the first thing everyone's gonna do is put it on the shelf and say never use this unless a patient has this, this uh, organism because we don't, we don't wanna develop resistance to that. That's not a great economic model for drug companies when it takes billions of dollars to develop a new drug. It, the same thing sort of happens in oncology. As you say, okay, here's the likely mechanism of resistance. There's usually many patients have other things. It's a smaller and smaller population as you go down the road. And so how can we develop those drugs much more efficiently? Because if, if it's $3 billion a pop, we just won't be able to do it. So I, I think that's something we have to figure out. FDA has to help us with, and uh, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. 
So I'm going to start another question, but I do want to have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Um, so I just want to, so you mentioned the, you know, there's academic industry um, collaboration. So traditionally, uh, the university are making their new discovery, training the next generation of scientists, and the commercialization really depends on the pharmaceutical companies. As we've many uh, recent years, there are many, many academic drug discovery centers being established. I just wonder from the panel, what's our view about, you know, what's the value proposition uh, this center is bringing to the ecosystem in drug discovery? I'll let the panelists chime in first. You guys probably have first-hand experience. Well, I'll just start with, I don't have a great deal of experience working with industry um, in terms of collaborating on projects. Um, in our work on looking at GPCR kinase inhibitors, I was approached by folks in industry who wanted to know how I solve structures so that they can start their own rational design programs there. And I didn't start my uh, own attempts to find inhibitors until the companies <laughs> that I was working with gave up. Um, they weren't necessarily trying maybe the best screens for the targets that we were working on, and I understood these targets very well on a, on a molecular level. And so we decided to use that knowledge to figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. um, there's many reasons why drug companies give up on projects. You know, they get bought out. You know, they get new corporate leadership who decide that they have different emphasis areas. Or they just don't find anything that works. And so it, it's impossible for me to know, um, not being an insider, what the reasons are. But we've had, I felt, remarkable success by really getting to know the molecules that we are targeting, um, as opposed to a very um, hands-off approach. Well, if we have a million compounds and we screen them, we're going to find something. And, and develop them from there. Both approaches work, but I think where the academics really excel is just um, knowing from a very targeted way, you know, how you might go about designing better therapeutics for, for some of these targets. I think some of the advantages of these centers is that diversity that can come together between, um, you know, individuals knowing very different molecules in, with uh, folks who have very different ideas about how to use them and being able to bring together folks with funding and research support around that, it's really beneficial um, to see not just you know, an interesting science question, but then how can that translate to uh, really actually changing people's lives? I personally believe the industry academia relationship is very, very vital for drug discovery today. You know the history of Eli Lilly, uh, Ted Taylor at Princeton University, he was making butterfly pigments. And then he was also collaborating, he was a consultant at Eli Lilly and, and helping, you know, developing our heterocyclic molecule. They team up and ultimately uh, Princeton in collaboration, uh, Ted Taylor's group at Princeton in collaboration with Eli Lilly they actually developed this drug called Olimta, solid, you know, and that is actually a blockbuster drug. And, and so you can imagine that, you know, these kind of things are not possible because sometimes in academic laboratory, our emphasis on new target, new opportunity. Also, we go typically sub, some areas where nobody ever walked. Part of the reason is, you know, if you work in an area where Eli Lilly is working, government is not going to give us funding. So funding is always difficult. I can tell you for myself, you know, I was working and collaborating with National Institute of Health because I did not have any other biological expertise. And when we created a molecule and we have a naive ideas how to really, uh, how to con you know, combat drug resistance, and NI scientists just asked me, said, what have you created? And they actually took the lead and they took this molecule all the way and, and then put this in the federal registry and all the biotech company came and they you know, basically developed this drug. So you know, I think that it is really remarkable that, you know, that today so many academicians are working in cutting edge areas and our basic problem here is we are actually teaching training students. We are not here to really discover drug, but what we teach and train students today 
and that is actually not only helping academic research, but also helping companies like Eli Lilly. So this partnership is actually a very, very, very important partnership. Agree, yeah. agree. And I, I think, though, unfortunately, there are just too many hurdles for collaboration between academia and industry. It's so complicated to get these collaborations started. Like scientists on both sides have a meeting in the mind, and they want to work together, and they're excited. And then there's just all these layers of bureaucracy and red tape on both sides that like make it so frustrating. Yeah, that I agree. Yeah. But, but Purdue has been an exception. Yeah. Like, it, I just want to say that, you know, and it's probably because of the great history between our two institutions and, and leaders who are like-minded that we were able to enter into this sort of unique relationship with Purdue with this five-year agreement that sort of covers lots of different areas that has, has dramatically facilitated uh, interactions between our scientists. We've tried to replicate that in other places, and we haven't been able to. So I, I think it is something unique yeah. and should be a model. So I have a really small request to you. Yeah. I mean, I right. really, these are my yeah. colleagues here, yes. so I can talk to them all the time. So you're very close to uh, our president, Mitch Daniel. So tell him. <laughs> cut down He's not going to listen to me. But. Yeah, <laughs> cut down the bureaucracy. I will tell you my, my personal experience. Eli Lilly scientist. You know, they contacted me about you know, six, seven years ago. They wanted to have a sample of a natural product we created called Largazole. Mm -hmm. And they found that you know, they do not have access to these. And it took me literally over eight months to send this compound to Eli Lilly. Just because you know, so many bureaucracy, they just don't want me to send you know, all the MTA. So this is what we face, you know, just imagine what we also face with, with the grants, you know. So, so please I'll tell me. I'll do my best. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> no problem. I'd like to really have some uh, time for the audience. Um, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for being here, doctor. I appreciate your, uh, your, your passion that, that is Thank clear. You. I may be just, uh, we may be drowning in a system and I'm describing the water, but when you talk about pharmaceuticals being vilified, you have the yeah. Sacklers, you have EpiPens going yes. up exponentially, you've got you know, just problem after problem after problem. You're a trillion dollar industry with roughly a 20% profit margin. There's huge money involved, there has to be money involved in it, but the system is set up at cross purposes. Um, I don't know how you fix it, but I want you closer to the patient side when drugs are released because I don't know that the financial side is ever going to understand or see that through their blind spot of revenue, whereas I want you there moving medicine forward. So go burn the whole system down, rebuild it in a correct purpose, and <laughs> make it all very workable and fair, equitable, yeah. globally. Thanks. I, I, of course, I, I would like that too. Not. Um, on behalf of Lilly, like on behalf of patients, right? Because there's no question that patients are suffering. Um, there are some bad actors in the industry, as I said, and, and you pointed out, but it's not representative of most of us. But patients, like, and we haven't spoken of drug pricing here, but that's clearly what's at the root of all this. <laughs> patients are suffering. They, at the pharmacy counter, they're paying crazy amounts of money that's not coming to us um, for, for their medicines. And, and yet, and, and it's going up every year, like, which is crazy. Uh, and yet, on a national level, you know, when the Federal Reserve meets to talk about inflation and disinflation, they point out drug pricing as a disinflationary, a deflationary trend, because drug pricing is going down every year. Um, but the patients are paying more every year. If you look at the overall healthcare system, drug pricing, 50 years ago, drugs were 10% of our healthcare economy. Today, they're 10% of our healthcare economy. But everybody thinks that it's like drugs that have caused the growth in our healthcare economy. So there's definitely a problem, um, and the problem is, is what patients have to pay for their medicines at the pharmacy. I, I don't think industry uh, can solve this alone. Uh, there's uh, a lot of interest in Washington in solving it, but then there's also a lot of gridlock in Washington. So who, who knows how, how this will turn out. But I, I do hope there'll be something quite different than we have today in the future. There's a question over there. Uh, thank you guys for a very engaging discussion. It's been great to hear. Um, I agree that I think the farm industry and the food industry, which I'm a part of, is unnecessarily vilified. And I think probably a lot of that goes back to education. So I have a question for the group of, clearly the government's failed, academia has failed in many ways to educate the public in these areas. 
when does we reach a tipping point where industry steps in and starts spending money to correct this problem? Should, should I start? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we try. I mean, there's this um, um, Go Boldly campaign. It's kind of like Got Milk, right, that the, I guess the farm cow industry started. We're, we're like all the pharma companies contribute to, to the, our parent organization, Pharma, to just put out science stories uh, on TV of scientists who are working on really cool stuff to help treat serious diseases. Um, but it's like uh, such a small piece compared to all of the other forces that are, that are speaking against the industry. Um, I, I don't know what, what more we could do. I mean, for me, it's sort of just going back to the patients and the science and like the remarkable progress that we've made how can you take that for granted? Um, and the remarkable progress has yet to be made. Just have to keep telling the story, I think. I don't know if others have better ideas. I think what you did today is really uh, very representative. I think showing the history, well, I think you're right. There are going to be people, people who don't have a concept of polio and uh, giving a, a really clear indication of what the world might look like if these triumphs hadn't happened. Uh, I think more and more of that different contexts would be very valuable. Hello, I'm a graduate student. And so we are constantly comparing if we want to go into industry and academia. And something we worry about is the, the next big bubble. And so what if we you know, spend 10, 20 years in academia on one protein, one disease, and with all this new precision medicine, how, as a student, do we prepare our ourselves to find the next bubble field and get the skill sets to be able to train. Yeah. So you want to be in the bubble. Is that what you're saying? Because <laughs> um, sometimes they pop. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe the other panelists have ideas of, of sure, where that, what's exciting now. Well, how do you tell it? I don't know if you need to worry about that so much. I would follow your passion, you know, and as as a graduate student, I've, I've always told my trainees, your job here is to pick up a lot of skills and as many diverse skills and to think intelligently about the problems in front of you. The, many of my trainees have gone on in the, the industry and are working in pharma or in AbbVie and places like that. They're not doing anything remotely similar to what they did when they worked for me. Yet they're highly successful scientists, I like to think, because I help them think scientifically about their problems. And so I don't think you have to worry that you're pigeonholing yourself by learning one technique um, that's going to attack you know, biological therapy or immunotherapy, for example, that you can't transition into something else. I just haven't personally seen that yeah. to be a big issue. So that, that's perfect advice. I mean, I, when we hire people from, from academia, like, rarely it's because of their particular domain expertise that we want someone to continue working on what they worked on in academia. It's just as you said. We're looking for people who've been trained to think scientifically, who are curious and motivated and willing to work hard um, and are, are quick learners. And so uh, I, for one, don't like do anything that I was trained at. I was trained to look under a microscope at slides. That doesn't help me do my job. But what helps me is being trained to be a good scientist, to care about patients, to work hard, to focus on quality. Those things are important. So you mentioned there's a long connection, Purdue and uh, yeah. Lily, we have over 1,200 um, graduate actually working on Lily, so we're really looking forward to working more. more closely with Lily and to train the next generation of uh, drug developers. But with that, I would like to really close the panel session because Don also has other agen uh, things on the agenda. I really want to thank Dan for participating in this 150th year anniversary. I gave a very inspiring talk. I want to thank all the panelists for a very engaging discussion. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here.